Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House alongside the man himself, the legend, Mr. Martin Popoff. Yes, morning, sir. Morning, sir. Look at looking, looking forward to doing some power metal uh today, some alternate history of power metal, I suppose. Yeah, on this uh cool. on this summer day in Toronto. So <laughs> it is raining and damp and cold here in New York. So oh, yeah, it's very unusual that you and I have complete opposite sort of weather um, yeah. in Canada. Toronto had a record, record high yesterday. How much? Uh, about, about, what was it? 11.8 uh, uh, Celsius. So I, what, what would that be? 60, 70, something like that. Somewhere in there. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's pretty wild. I, I think we're supposed to get here on sunday i don't know my mother's like it's gonna be 60 on sunday i'm like 60 how is that possible it's been the 30s all week i'll tell you in a second martin uh but yeah no it is gonna warm up a little bit so they are saying here sunday what is she talking about it says 40 degrees hmm. that's not 60 come on <laughs> i don't know what she's looking at but anyway tomorrow 34 sunday 40 monday and tuesday oh, oh here we go so monday tuesday wednesday well, I'm up in Boston here. It's going to be 50, 52, and 56. Rain all week. Oh, oh yeah. I, I probably got that conversion wrong. And apparently it's getting cold again, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, well, you know, you can't trust this stuff, right? So yeah. it's like, uh, win that's winter. It's unpredictable. So I, I, everybody's already talking about, yeah, spring is just right around the corner. I'm like, eh, don't think that too hard because winter will throw you a curveball and we'll get like a foot of snow, like a March 12th or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. I tend to not get too excited. So when it's April, that's then we that's a different story. After Easter, we can we can talk. Anyway, we've got a uh, a very fun show for you here today. Uh, kind of talking about Martin and I. We're talking about power metal, and, and this kind of I think the genesis of this episode kind of goes back to an episode we did a few weeks ago about this whole different genres, U.S. versus U.K. and who wins and whatnot. Yeah. And that kind of like opened up the floodgates to other things we could talk about uh, as far as like where did certain types of uh, musical genres originate? And, you know, Martin and I started talking about power metal and everybody assumes that power metal was a European thing, a German thing or whatnot. And... The more you really start looking at it and going back a little bit, that's I don't really think it's the case. Martin doesn't really think it's the case. So we're here to make a little argument that a lot of what we know today is power metal had its roots here in the U.S. And a lot of different types of metal kind of coming together in the U.S. may be an answer to the new wave of British heavy metal because we, as we stated a couple of weeks ago, the U.S. really had no answer to the new wave of British heavy metal, not at that time, but maybe I think something was brewing. I don't know, Martin, if you want to kind of expand on that a little bit before we get into the four categories we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I always found this uh, this topic kind of interesting. I mean, we uh, we covered it with uh, Metal Evolution um, with those episodes, and we probably even did a Lock Horns or something on it, I believe. I, I know we did an early history of power metal, but yeah, I mean, we always, we always sort of assume that uh, it's got kind of the sacred texts of uh of proto or pre-power metal and this is kind of interesting the way we talked about proto hair metal as well right you know you could think of how these things sort of come together but you know we think of the sacred texts more or less in the 70s being uh you know a handful of deep purple albums um a bunch of judas priest albums rainbow rising long live rock and roll maybe some uri heap in there you know something sort of classical based and then we talked about the new wave of british heavy metal as well so you know when when we talk about the proto um i would say i would say that still leans completely european right um but um what happens is um you know when when we talk about kind of the the main the main bands and i'm just remembering from memory this was years ago we did this lock horns episode uh with uh with um banger films but you know it it comes down to the likes of uh definitely definitely in a huge way early angve malmsteen all of the new wave of swedish heavy metal stuff and certainly halloween seems to be like a like a real ground zero the baby <laughs> yeah. iron maiden sort of thing but yep. but our point here is that um you know, it's almost like uh, it's almost like uh, toiling away in the engine room, the blue collar version of this, the plumber, the people who keep society going by fixing stuff. Uh, it, it feels like there's this there's this base of uh, of toiling away 
and I and I go that 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 route because I've often you know been known and I get heck for it by calling this poverty metal, right? This idea <laughs> of poverty metal, where where there there is sort of this uh, this layer of uh, of bands um, that I guess are a reaction uh, or one of the reactions to the new wave of British heavy metal. The same way, you know, we looked at we looked at hair metal being uh you know a a valid reaction and then off to the races sort of thing so so we've broken this up in, into four categories and and to try not to step too far forward on on each other's later categories um the first thing i wanted to mention was just this idea of uh shrapnel records and metal blade kind of set the stage for this right and and with metal blade um you know i took out my uh my metal blade 20th anniversary box set. And I was going through the, or this is the, um, well, yeah, it's, it's the, it's the metal blade 20th anniversary, but it also has a, a kind of a good feel of, uh, of where you get the idea of the early comps. Like they do things sort of chronologically. And it's funny. Um, you know, I'm in my notes, I've got here that, uh, I can't mention past disc one essentially on this because, um, you know, we get into your categories, which is kind of interesting. And then, and then metal blade goes through this later history where, where metal starts fragmenting and they start, you know, floundering around trying to find themselves and getting into alternative, alternate forms of metal. So, so metal blade and shrapnel, just to mention metal blade uh, to begin with. So in the early days, uh, when you have the, the metal massacre samplers, um, I'm just looking who's on disc one of this, uh, of this, uh, 20th anniversary. We got Metallica with hit the lights. We got malice, bitch, demon flight, armored saint, warlord, bitch, again, slayer, trouble, witch killer. And we're almost getting too late at this point. Uh, but when you think of these early bands, the, the interesting thing, and this is just like that thing I brought up where I did my uh, History in Five Songs episode on how Lars Ulrich invented hair metal, right? Well, at the same time, um, you know, Lars and all these journalists and everybody there were, were uh, inventing uh, a, a more proximate reaction to the new wave of British heavy, which was this sort of just generalized metal, right? It, it just seems like traditional, we call it meat and potatoes metal. Um, and that's, that's kind of what you get out of these early metal blade bands. You get, you get a mix of, uh, you get like 10 or 15% of them have a, an almost an un, uncomfortable amount of hair metal in them. And then you've got 10 or 15% of them who are inventing extremity uh in terms of thrash and death and noise um you get some anomalies in there with some doom with trouble but yep. the, the core of it and everybody has a bit of this you think of you think of our bike wheel concept the core of it is just uh you know, and, and, and almost like an update on 70s metal crossed with a little new wave of British heavy metal, which was an update anyway. So it's just this traditional metal core. So you get that with Metal Blade. With Shrapnel, uh, you get U.S. Metal Volume 1, U.S. Metal Volume 2, which are exactly like the Metal Massacre comps, essentially. Shrapnel 3 is the Wild Dog self-titled album. You know, Matthew T. McCourt out of Portland. Uh, that is a perfect example of this quietly toiling away traditional u.s version of power metal uh you get exciter heavy metal maniac now we're moving into that short-lived genre called speed metal it's a little extreme but it's also a little power metal uh you get steeler so steeler is sitting there with a little bit of hair metal to them you know this is the angve malmsteen version of steeler but really you know at this stage before you know ron keel becomes keel um it is essentially like squarely just right in this, this traditional thing. Uh, you know, I remember getting as a new release culprit guilt, guilty as charged out of Seattle. So you get, uh, again, just a, a, a very traditional priest derived sort of heavy metal and, and something like a Hawaii one nation underground, big chunk of traditional in there, little bit technical, little bit speedy, Marty Friedman, right. That whole thing. Um, so yeah, that's that's my first category where you know I'm 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 thinking like 82, 83 into early 84, whatever. You've got um Mike Varney and Brian Slagle essentially um positing the argument or creating this subtle, subtle new form of music that in retrospect, when we look back, 
we call it the American style of power metal. Yeah. And we're going to revisit this, a lot of these bands, I'm going to revisit later on in the episode to kind of finish it all off. What Martin and I are calling the foot soldiers, right? So the, the these are these bands that make up this whole poverty metal, these bands that were kind of all there and everybody's heard the names, but they yeah. never really rose above a certain level of success here compared to some of the other bands we're going to talk about. So for, my, for the first category I'm going to talk about here, we're going to kind of... We're going to deviate slightly uh, only because we look back on some of the bands I'm going to talk about here now as a, another distinct style of music. But at the time, nobody was calling it progressive metal, right? So you had this form of kind of traditional metal that utilized prog influences, and maybe they got their influences from Yes and from Rainbow and Deep Purple and Black Sabbath and certainly Rush, right? But it was still heavy, somewhat dark music, certainly melodic yet technical lots of intricate guitar solos sometimes they use keyboards sometimes not but you know longer songs a little bit to doom histrionic vocals right it was a little bit different and arguably the band that kind of started all this was Queensryche from seattle washington right it started with the ep most people i'm sure of a certain age remember when this album hit we were all kind of like oh my god what is this all about and this we were calling it kind of like thinking man's metal back then and then of course they put out uh, the warning you had rage for order which was a little bit more commercial and then of course operation mind crime the big concept album right maybe one of the pinnacles of the early progressive metal scene but queens were basically taking this formula judas priest rush rainbow and making it something completely different and so most people when they think of the birth of progressive metal kind of go there but at the same time in connecticut you had this other little band again, Metal Blade comes into, you know, again, we're going to talk so much about Metal Blade and Combat and Shrapnel. I mean, that's where all this stuff kind of started. Uh, you had a band called Fate's Warning out of uh, Stanford, Connecticut, I believe they were from somewhere in that area. Uh, the Spectre Within, this is really their second album, but this is where the sound really starts to happen. And here you have five guys a singer who can hit those high notes just kind of like a Jeff Tate, but this is more moody, brooding music. Martin mentioned Doom before. You're going to hear a little bit of Doom in some of these bands, especially these guys. It's kind of Doomy. It's very proggy. Uh, that album comes out. Then you have Awaken the Guardian, which is even more mind-blowing, longer songs, more intricate. Uh, but it definitely had like kind of like a European flavor at the time, even though there wasn't a big European scene happening right then and there. They switched singers. No Exit kind of takes things in even a little bit. This sounds a little thrashy. It's certainly doomy. You had another singer who could hit all those high notes and Ray Alder. And all of a sudden, you now you've kind of got this whole kind of progressive metal thing going on. So the forefathers of this, definitely those two bands. Hot on their heels, though. Band from Long Island. Dream Theater. When Dream and Day comes. So all of a sudden, now they're taking the complexity and the epicness of Rush putting it into a metal framework so this sounds very very different from these other two bands that i just mentioned there are some similarities of course they hit big with uh images and words new singer on board right so both of these last two have uh, a singer change fairly early on then they go moving into the 90s even further with albums like awake and they're still going today uh so here you have this kind of more technical form of music it still has lots of traditional metal involved, but all of a sudden you've got like pop hooks and lots of great melodies and things like that. Uh, also, during the 80s, maybe a little bit more into the underground, though, you have a band like Crimson Glory. Again, very much owing a lot to the Queensryche formula. They go and they they start off, they wear masks and whatnot, but very technical form of this, this kind of new type of metal sound. These guys are from Florida. They released the self-titled debut and then uh, even more proggy album called transonance very technical but very accessible all at the same time you had other bands like uh from seattle another band from seattle you had air apparent okay very much in a similar style to this you had the two albums here you got graceful inheritance from 86 one small voice from 89 and then a band uh from uh down in texas king's x all right maybe a little bit more straightforward hard rock but certainly there is some progressive elements going on here. Definitely something different. Again, this whole idea of thinking man's classic metal. Uh, also from California, you had another band called Psychotic Waltz. 
they hit with an out. And, and again, they had this kind of brooding, slightly technical, technical, but also very psychedelic form of heavy metal. Uh, they released um, a couple albums in the early 80s uh, or the early 90s, I should say, a Social Grace into the Everflow Mosquito. Uh, again, another band to add to this kind of growing a number of progressive metal bands that are kind of power. And I think we should kind of also mention here, Martin, too, that how many power metal bands have we seen over the last 20 or so years that do both the classic power metal style and add progressive elements? And I think a lot of the bands we're going to talk about today are so important into what we now call power metal today or what we call progressive power metal or symphonic and epic power metal. Look at bands like Camelot and so on and so forth. I think, oh, so much to so many of these bands that we're going to cover today. So here, that's the, uh, the oh, and I almost forgot one, another band from Texas, Watchtower. All right, so had two albums, Energetic Disassembly in 85 and Control in Resistance in 89. Very, very important one of the early bands, but I think where they differed from Queensryche and Fate's Warning is they played this much, much more technical style of metal. You had the singer who could hit these ridiculous high notes. You got a guy named Ron Jazombeck on guitar who can play these just uncanny things, you know, these crazy technical solos, these off-kilter riffs, these kind of like speed metal underpinning. I would say Watchtower kind of took the shrapnel framework and made it even more complex and I would even uh, go as far as to say that Watchtower probably influenced a lot of the technical and progressive death metal bands that were right around the corner, like Atheist and Pestilence and Death and bands of that sort, Cynic, all those other bands. So very, a very influential uh, group of bands we're talking about here. So this whole progressive metal scene, 83 to the late, late later part of the decade into the early 90s uh and we saw so much other stuff like this come afterwards so i'll stop there turn it back over to you yes yeah, so, so the summary of this is that when we talk about power metal these days or say any time from like say 1997 forward sort of thing uh it just blurs completely in with progressive yeah. metal right uh you know symphony x is a great example of this as well and and, and another american band right yeah. um but our point here is that is that really uh, this large component of power metal, uh, you know, you, you owes a lot of credit to a whole pile of American bands. American bands were doing this way more convincingly, uh, you know, doing doing the updated rush thing. Um, you know, over overseas, you have you might have had the likes of uh, Sabat, Rage, Coroner, Mekong Delta, uh, you know, and they're they're all going. They're all they're all more at the extreme end of things. Um, and even a little, little more straight lined, I would say, I mean, I, I think, I think the American stuff is, is much more convincing. Uh, you know, when you mentioned Seattle, we, you know, you got sanctuary into nevermore as well. Mm -hmm. I, I even thought more dread, um, was a little bit this way. And then, and then shrapnel, I mean, you could say that, that once you get into your, your Vinnie Moore, fifth angel, Richie Kotzen, racer X, Chastain, Greg, Howe, Joey Tafola, Tony McAlpine, that, that whole um, or or take take all those just there's just Christian names guys, um you know that that is that is a form of progressive metal in itself, um so you've got yeah. that whole American industry that's part of this too. I mean you know you mentioned Symphony X before. I mean look at uh, you know Michael Romeo obviously was influenced by a lot of those guys you just mentioned the whole shrapnel group. I mean what they were basically doing was this kind of uh, speed metal neoclassical hard rock mix which you know now we know is neoclassical metal and they were doing all that and that stuff is pretty technical and highly progressive so i think most of these progressive metal bands were and even a lot of power metal bands to follow were grabbing all those little bits especially if you were a guitar player you know how were you not influenced by that whole scene so i think you can't understate the shrapnel influence on everything we're talking about today i think you know people yeah. just you know it's a bunch of, it was a bunch of shredders on a whole shitload of albums but i think it was much much more than that yeah yeah okay so the next category here is is we were going to propose is there a big four of uh of uh american power metal um and i'm not so sure because i thought of a late entry that might kick out one of my other ones and i don't even know which one to kick out because it's a, it's a weird little world right uh in fact out of all of these i've got five to propose and really, there's only one I totally believe in completely, like without any asterisks to it. Um, well, let's start with that one. So I I think uh, definitely uh, a, a big four of power metal is Metal Church. 
Um, so I wanted to show you my two favorite metal church albums. These are these are after the first death. Uh, wow. Three or four. Uh, the Human Factor and Hanging in the Balance. These are amazing, incredible, heavy, chunky albums where there's a little bit of an updating to the sound, a uh, really good bottom end. Um, but, you know, the uh, the sort of sacred texts are, are um, you know, Metal Church and uh, and uh, or what, what are the other ones called here? Um, we got Blessing in Disguise. You know, the, the we got the two David Waynes. And then we've got the Mike Howes. Right. I believe that's right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're major label albums, uh, yeah. but all of us always complain and we say, oh, Metal Church should have been bigger. But then that but then very quickly, we also add that. They were a little behind the times compared to Metallica, right? You know, you got the two metal bands and it's just it's just such a perfect, uh, you know, snapshot in in one is taking something new and exciting and just taking off with it. And the other one's got one foot in the past, one one foot in the future. Right. And it wasn't enough. Right. Um, it wasn't enough for everybody to be to be into that. Right. Uh, they looked a little bit like Saxon as well, I suppose. You know, not, not, <laughs> you say that, yeah. not, a, not as extremely, but uh, yeah. but uh, I, I just love the sound that they ended up with later on uh, with these two albums. And then, of course, they keep going. Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, they're they're definitely uh, like a cornerstone of this by being a major label band as well. Um, but the ones that kind of have an asterisk to them, and this is one that you think shouldn't have an asterisk, but I'll explain why. Man of War. So Man of War is so incredibly power metal in look, in image, in lyrics. Um, but the music's a little weird, right? It's a very buzzy bass and very Billy Sheehan bass sometimes uh, to the thing. And odd production. They go for a strange production sound. They're they're a strange cult unto themselves. And then they also have this uh, this weird career that just seems like um, it, it almost seems like there's a media ban on on the band in North America. And no one really thinks people remember them and then they forget about them. They remember them. And they forget about them because it just seems like as they will tell us uh, all their success is overseas in in you know, Germany and Greece and all this kind of thing. Yeah, right. They haven't had a presence here in so long. Really. Yeah, it's, it's it's very bizarre. And then when they do all sorts of drama happens, the ticket prices are too high and, you know, Joey's pissed off from the stage and all this sort of stuff. And Eric's, you know, throwing some tantrum or whatever. And the volume is way too loud and, and, and all this stuff demands, demands, you know, on riders and things like that. Uh, so it's, so it's funny. There's always drama. So, so it's a weird one where people just forget about that band and they're, they're kind of an interesting anomaly anyways. Right. Um, and another one with a bit of an asterisk is Dio where, you know, half the band is uh is irish and scottish and the other half is american so do they really count it's the whole does gillen belong in the new wave british heavy metal and blah 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 right um so so the funny thing about this band is that uh you know you would think like i i'd say from an exposure point of view they're by far the most famous american power metal band right um and uh, and the music is squarely perfectly exactly what we're talking about here we're talking about uh, a bit of a lunch bucket sound uh you know it's it's not too over the top and too sing-songy and ronnie doesn't like keyboards and all that kind of stuff um so so it's got a real sort of a a, a good solid american core to it you know like i say pa pack that lunch and go to the factory and come home and do it again the next day or whatever um so so it's uh and yeah, super famous band. Um, and then I guess it's American enough because it feels it feels American, um, you know, major label band and all that. Um, another one with an asterisk, I think, is uh, Sabotage. Uh, it's just that these first two albums are so good and such masterpieces. And they are exactly what we're talking about again. This is like supercharged. These are like the two best Dio albums. These are both, these, these might be better than any Dio album, these two. I mean, they're both incredible, right? Oh, yeah. Um, they're really, really good. Um, and and they sound like they sound like Dio albums, right? Um, and uh, so so this is this is good quality. Uh, you know, right at the core U.S. power metal. But then, of course, the interesting thing about this band is that they they put out one pooch and then they come back and yeah, the EP's good and 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 that and. But as they move on and you get into streets and beyond, 
uh, they become this interesting, squarely power metal band of the new style that combines uh, the power metal with concept and progressive metal, right? And then the last one, I didn't, I didn't pull a prop, but the, but the late comer to this whole thing that I propose, and I don't know how true this is, but Wasp, right? Wasp is an interesting one, prolific, big band. Um, are they too hair metal? That's the debate. Um, are they not? Um, are they a little bit weird sounding? Um, are they not? Are they possibly too dirty sounding in the production? Too busy in the drumming? Too raspy in the vocals? So probably they they don't fit. But I swear, I, as I went through this exercise to come up with a big four, I feel like I'm forgetting one or two. And I don't know any any comments. Anybody you can think of glaring that should be in there? Not off the top of my, and you know, the only other band, because Wasp was an interesting pick because they never really, in my eyes, never really fit in anywhere. They really, to me, weren't part of the whole glam hair metal thing. They sort of were, but not. They definitely weren't thrash. Um, at times, it was almost like they weren't metal enough, but they still were pretty heavy. I would think another band, too, that maybe, does Y&T maybe fit in here a little yeah. bit? I kind of thought about them a little too, right? Yeah. Because you know, yeah. white, uh, Black Tiger and uh, Mean Street kind of, and maybe Earthshaker kind of, some of that stuff could fit into this category here. Yeah, certainly not anything after that. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I and you know, just to comment on a couple of these, uh, I, mean, I think Metal Church is a, is a great pick because it's like we want to put them there. But your whole comment about how Metal Church was always slightly behind the curve a little bit, I think is true. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they hit a little late to like that debut album. Maybe if that came out a year before, might be a little bigger than it was. But I think they kind of like always were like a Metallica shadow. Uh, they changed singers constantly, right? They changed band members and labels all the time um there are a lot of stop stops and starts there but i think their music you know it's not quite thrash it's not quite extreme metal it's certainly just american metal and i think there's a lot of what we hear from other bands in all parts of the world that owe a lot to those first couple of metal church albums uh as far as sabotage go yeah i mean those first those first two albums are doomy heavy dark uh great guitar work those amazing vocals hall of the mountain king is terrific and then all of a sudden with gutter ballet and streets and everything after that you've got this progressive element this theatrical element um all these concepts and whatnot but i think at their core they were always were a really good u.s power metal band so yeah that's that's a lot of records and and a lot of records on major labels and you got fight for the rock you got dungeons are calling ep i mean there's there's a lot there so yeah you'd have to so yeah let's say for sure metal church and sabotage but after that i'm not, I'm not sure we'll we'll see what the comments say who 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 are the big four of this right yeah because we're going to throw a lot of bands out and there might be a band that i'm going to mention uh in in a couple minutes that yeah. people may think deserve to be in the top you know into the the big four and i'll i'll highlight them when i get to them so mm -hmm. uh so so lastly we're going to kind of talk about we're going to circle back to this whole poverty metal thing that martin mentioned these foot soldiers so these are these bands all U.S. bands, a lot of them from all sorts of the places in, in the uh, in the states. A lot of them from the Los Angeles area and whatnot, and out in the West. But um, these bands were popping up on Metal Blade, on Shrapnel, on Combat Records, Enigma Records, all small label stuff. Uh, the whole tape trading thing was was in full flux at this point in time, and people were hearing about these bands left and right. So whether you actually owned any of their albums or not. You know, depends on how much you were buying this sort of thing, but they were showing up in all the underground metal magazines. You were seeing them everywhere, but none of these bands were as big as everything we've talked about so far. So uh, let's start. And I don't have props for everything, but uh, we'll go to um, Los Angeles, a band called Omen. So they had an album called Battle Cry in 1984. You had Warning of Danger, 85, The Curse in 86, and Escape to Nowhere in 88. And that was basically like their kind of time. But I remember buying The Curse in 86, and I bought it for that album cover. And I was like, holy cow, this is pretty good. It is pretty good. Uh, it's not polished. It's just good American metal of the time. Uh, Lizzie Borden, 
one of those bands that maybe could have crossed over into the kind of glam metal side because of his look, right? But they were from Los Angeles as well. You had Love You to Pieces, 85, Menace to Society, 86, uh, Visualize in 87. Um, they probably more than some of the other bands we're going to mention here probably had a much bigger exposure, I think. Again, the whole image thing. Because a lot of these bands, Martin pretty faceless and unmemorable right no personality to them it's like so you either knew the music that was it lizzie borden at least was trying to go for for the whole look to sort of thing uh another band from a lot, a lot of more like a rushed put together version of of the the classic judas priest uniform right pretty much yeah yeah they either had they were either going for the leather thing or they were going for the, like the dingy uh denim jackets right and whatnot so that that was kind of the look of a lot of these bands uh and another band from connecticut who were uh, very friendly with Fate's Warning, but chose a different uh, style of music as Liege Lord. Okay, another classic early Metal Blade, metal blade record uh, <clears throat> band. Freedom's Rise, 85, Burn to My Touch, 87, and uh, Master Control in 88. A very short career, but some pretty good albums and some really great album covers, right? So album covers were important. Some of these uh, from San Francisco, you had Vicious Rumors. And again, this some of these bands kind of move into the cold speed metal thrash early thrash sound vicious rumors i would say one of those uh soldiers in the night 85 digital dictator in 1988 and then the self-title in 1990 before they kind of petered out so we're seeing like a little trend here two three four albums tops and then these bands kind of go away and then the, you know probably the biggest of these bands that i'm going to talk about in this segment is uh arguably armored saint so this could be the band that maybe some feel belong into that upper echelon, right? So if these they were from Los Angeles, you have March of the Saint in 1984. A lot of buzz about this band, right? They went on stage wearing the armor and whatnot, but a little bit more melodic, I think, than some of these other bands. You had Delirious Nomad in 85, again, signed to a major label, right? Uh, this was Chrysalis Records, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And then they wound up being on Metal Blade later on. Uh, Raising Fear. 1987 you had symbol of salvation going into the 90s right a band still around today you know john bush of course left to go join anthrax so armored saint was kind of like non-existent for a while but then they got back together and they've been pretty steady ever since uh not a headline band but we're opening up for a lot of the bigger bands at the time uh martin mentioned hawaii they had uh from honolulu one nation underground in 83 the Natives of Restless 85, of course, that's with Marty Friedman on guitar before he would start doing all of the uh, shrapnel stuff. You had a band called Culprit out of Seattle, Washington. They had an album, Guilty as Charge, on 83, also on shrapnel. Uh, you had the Wild Dogs, which we mentioned earlier, from Portland, Oregon. They had the, their self-titled debut album in 1983, Man's Best Friend in 84, Reign of Terror 87, Shrapnel and Enigma Records. Uh, another kind of important band that nobody really talks about anymore, The Rods, right? Of course, featuring Ronnie James Dio's cousin uh, from Cortland, New York, all the way upstate from me. Uh, Rock Hard, 1980, Full Throttle, 81, Wild Dogs, 82, In the Raw, 83. And then they even had an album called Let Them Eat Metal in 84. It doesn't get much more metal than that, right? And again, uh, basically a 80s metal sound, but with a lot of uh, elements of stuff from, the, from hard rock from the 70s as well. Another band... Um, that uh, still around today with a lot of the starts and st stops and starts in their career and they were from uh ventura california and that is sirith ungol frost and fire right and again these great album covers king of the dead 84 one foot in hell 86 hard to describe almost kind of like extreme vocals for the time kind of doomy Kind of progressive, certainly classic power metal from here in the U.S. Really good band. Uh, Hellstar from Houston, Texas. Yep. Burning Star in 84. Remnants of War, 86. A Distant Thunder, 88. Nosferatu, 89. Combat Records to start. Eventually wound up on Metal Blade as well. Uh, band from Wichita, Kansas. This is a perfect indication of U.S. power metal at the time. Manila Road. You have Invasion, 1980, you've got, uh, and again, these guys had roots in the 70s, so they're kind of borderline what we're talking about here, but I think they really only started to get noticed in the uh, in the early 80s. You got the, their classic Crystal Logic from 83, uh, The Deluge, 86, 
got open the gates from 85 very prolific mystification as well from 87 uh, up until uh, mark shelton passed away a few years ago pretty prolific throughout their career just were always kind of there uh warlord from los angeles deliver us in 1983 and the canons of destruction have begun 84 here you have a tie to another band in the other category uh, their original drummer was Mark Zonder, who then went on to play for Fate's Warning in the 90s after Warlord kind of petered out. So, uh, and yeah, just to reiterate the whole shrapnel artist thing. So again, you had Marty Friedman, who did some solo albums, wound up being half of Cacophony with Jason Becker, also went into Megadeth. He was also in the uh, the Hawaii band we mentioned. You've got Jason Becker, also wound up in David Lee Roth, right? Did lots of solo albums. Tony McAlpine has done, you know, Ring of Fire later on, which is kind of like power metal, right? But much, much later than what we're talking about. Vinnie Moore did a bunch of solo albums, also was in UFO. So there's this kind of like, all these guys, all these bands just kind of mixing around and creating a really cool bedrock for a lot of the music that we talk about and know and love today. I mean, you know, to get back to the Man of War thing, do we have a band like Sabaton or even maybe Amana Marth today without having Man of War providing all what they did back in the 80s? You know, I think so influential. And yeah, Man of War, strange career, but I think you have to you have to put Man of War at the top, I think as uh, yeah. one of the kind of leaders of this, the, the way they dress, the lyrics, what they sing about, their attitude, right? It's almost like they're there. They have to be in character all the time. And uh, I think that's just so important to this whole thing we call power metal today. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the point here is that you cannot put together an as impressive a list of proto power metal bands or proto before we started using that term as this list that we have of American bands. You know, when, when I think of that Swedish thing, I think it kind of gets there a little bit, but it's, you know, it's the likes of your Axe Switch and my favorite Torch, um, but early Europe as well. Um, at Highway Child, um, maybe a little Vandenberg in there, perhaps. Oh, maybe for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so yeah, anything with kind of a European thing. I mean, I think another big one that you would put in a, uh, a big four of proto, um, and it's not an American band would be accept. So I think you might have, you know, if, if you allow, if you say, okay, let's, let's take the country, uh, thing off of it. I think Dio is, is the biggest, um, and then accept feels like it's in that space between, uh, you know, Dio and then Metal Church and Armored Saint. So, so far, so far, I'm really liking the Metal Church, Armored Saint and Sabotage as, as, as three uh, that absolutely get in. So, so we're, we're maybe missing a fourth, but, uh, but yeah, just um, so interestingly going through this Metal Blade history, as you go from disc one into disc two into disc three um, bands, we haven't mentioned, uh, we'll probably mentioned most of these. Let's see, we got Nasty Savage. Oh um, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, Sound Barrier, uh, Flotsam and Jetsam we didn't mention. So mm -hmm. again, um, we've got Sound Barrier is just straight down the middle, you know, speedy technical metal, and uh, Nasty Savage is uh, is kind of a little Nasty Savage always reminded me of our Canadian bands. Uh, May he rest in peace, Gord Kirchen and Pile Driver right oh. uh which was an interesting kind of thing and nasty savage is is a little bit like that um hallows eve uh, i'm not sure you mentioned them but it it again the album covers everything about it it's it's this dark uh technical extreme version of power metal that takes a little bit of spirit from from your man of wars or, or whatnot you know and the other point i wanted to make is that um the guys who were going to invent power metal over in europe be it germany or sweden or whatever late 90s into the 2000s they loved all these old metal blade bands right it was it was you know part of the reason they they did what they did you know moving into uh disc three so we've got uh who do we got in here um well okay so brian's signing some uh some international stuff here we've got diamond head candle mass um let's see so heretic fits he's got sacred reich which doesn't really fit we got anvil from canada which definitely kind of fits um and moving forward we got princess pang 
We've got, and now, so now you're moving into uh, the the what do we do with ourselves years of Metal Blade, where you've got Gore, Cannibal Corpse, Legs Diamond. So he's got he's remnants. Brian is getting into the bands that he loved in the seventies. That he oh, I got to sign those guys, right? Uh, Lethal didn't fit anywhere. Um, Junk Monkeys, he signed Stars, so he had Stars and just reissued stuff, right? Um, but yeah, he's got Y&T uh, even included in the Metal Blade history. God, Earl Slick, Armored Saint. Uh, so yeah, we know Armored Saint comes back to the pack. So yeah, they, I, I guess, you know, just, just to kind of wrap up, yeah, the, the point here I think is that uh, there's a large, large, huge platform of these bands. You know, we, we, we like to ascribe the keyboards and the uh, and the um, you know the the uh, uh, classical melodies to all this as the chief thing that power metal has, but you know the other 60, 70 percent of it, uh, we we owe the we owe the states, we owe all of these bands, we owe Mike Varney and Brian Slagle uh, essentially, um, you know to 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 creating this platform for power metal. So, uh, so yeah, power metal didn't really come from Europe. Oh, I, you know, the one point I want to make, I was just looking here. Um, you know, Halloween is, uh, is 85 with an EP and an album. And then the keepers stuff, you know, starts arriving in 70. That's when you are 87. That's where you get your real, you know, th that to me, that to me feels like, you know, I, I would go with, uh, I actually would go with walls of Jericho over keeper as, as like, the start of power metal oh, although sure. although maybe maybe the second angbe malmstein album is is pretty much dead on as well marching out yeah. yeah 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 and you know what's interesting about halloween because that if you listen to walls of jericho and then you listen to keeper of the seven keys both either one of them there's a there's a big difference between them they're, yeah. they're all, all three are really great and you have to wonder if uh like by the time Keeper comes around, how influenced are they by a band like Queensryche or some of these more underground bands we've already talked about? Uh, you know, and again, it, it kind of goes back even further. So most people, when they talk about how influential to this genre of Halloween always have been right from the from the get go. But most people also mention how influenced they were by Iron Maiden. So in a sense, how influential is Iron Maiden then to everything we've talked about today? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're they're a huge one too. And so Halloween also, I almost feel like it's like Maiden is the big influence, but I think they're inspired by Metallica and yeah. and just the power and speed of thrash. Although they don't yeah. want to do that particularly, but they're they're excited by it, right? Yeah, um, kind of thing to to be the 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 younger, faster version of of Iron Maiden. So, yeah, ton, tons and tons of uh, I I think this whole thing. And like I say, I mean, I think the big thing is that um, if if you were from Europe, with that whole grass is green or somewhere else, or another country is more exotic than your own, you know, backyard kind of thing, um, they they looked upon they looked upon all these bands that we kind of kind of like snickered at a little bit, you know, to be honest, um, they looked upon those bands with a lot more romance than we did. Uh, and a lot more mystique, uh, you know, a, a lot of these metal blade things. Right. And, uh, and we, you know, I, I remember, you know, it was for, if it was from Europe, it was special, right. Oh, yeah. If it was from North America, now nah, we kind of they're they're kind of like us we know what they're doing we we can read their minds it's not as interesting or as mystical but yeah if it was from sweden for example like that that made it really cool right or and it, isn't story. there maybe even still today but certainly back then isn't there like this perception among bands that if you were on metal blade or combat or shrapnel back in the day you were part of a cutting edge label that was doing something really important and different to so the general public that like metal blade records never heard of them right it's not a blip on the radar but i think that there is this kind of feeling within the metal underground that not only were these labels special but if you were a band on this label if you can get on one of these labels you were done doing something truly groundbreaking and you were part of this kind of fraternity right that nobody else is so i think it's got this kind of like mythical quality and it's only increased in in the years since yeah, the themed label thing is is kind of a new thing. I mean, in the seventies, who did we have? Capricorn. That's pretty much it. Um, I can't think of too many themed labels, right? right. That that were uh, 
You know, I mean, I guess you had somewhere you felt that the milieu was more prog rock or something like that, but it wasn't fully themed that way. No, you see it a lot nowadays, right? You got inside out records for all, you know, that does does, does prog. You've got, um, you know, ripple music and heavy psych sounds, which do like the stoner and doom and all that sort of thing. You got, uh, you know, nuclear blast and century media and you have all these labels that specialize in certain kinds of music. But yeah, that wasn't really yeah. very common back then. And uh, certainly for a, a style of music like heavy metal to have like an underground label or two or three, uh, that was a pretty big deal back then. Yeah. My favorite album of all of these, Highway Child Storybook Heroes. Man, I, I just love that album to death. That is so kick-ass, that album. It's like this really heavy, boozy Def Leppard, you know, classic Def Leppard, boozed way up. You know, what a, what a great band. So, uh, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, even though we made this great case, I would still say most of my favorites are from Europe somewhere. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, well, we're mainly talking about the building blocks here, you know? So, yeah. so Mark, what would you say to, uh, viewers who maybe watch this episode and thinking, well, I never heard of half of these bands and they never made it big. So it probably means they weren't all that good because there is that perception from people that it's like, if it didn't, if it didn't sell millions of copies, that means it wasn't any good. Uh, I think we, I would argue that there's a lot of gems here that we talked about today that if you just take the time to go listen to them are really worth your, worth a listen, especially if you're a metal fan, right? Because I yeah. think a lot of the best metal didn't necessarily hit number 25 on the billboard charts or whatever. I mean, it's, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Although I suppose the cream did rise to the top somewhat. So if, if you think of metal church, sabotage, armored saint, for example, Dio, of course, um, you know, I think the best albums out of all of these are, are going to show up on, on a major label. Although one of the very best, the first sabotage was not even on a label. It was an indie. Right. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Sir Sirens is pretty special yeah. for folks who have not heard Sirens by Sabotage. Yeah. Yeah. That is a crushing album, crushing album. It's my, uh, that's the original cover. Yeah, the original cover, yeah. Yeah. I, I when I bought mine, it had the uh the cover Mine is with the ladies blue, on the front. Mine is black. Yeah. 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 I remember seeing this in the store in Spokane and flipping it over and thinking, yeah, it's got a song called Twist Little Sister. They know who Twisted Sister is, so that's gotta work. Uh a song called Scream Murder. And uh then you look at the instruments, right? John Oliver, Shrieks of Terror, Chris Oliver, Metal Axe. I was sold right then, right? Um Steve uh, Washholtz, Barbaric Cannons, Keith Collins, the bottom, the bottom end. So, you know, just looking at this, it was, this was a total risk. Yeah. Um, but it, they were sending, they were sending the little signals in, you know, if you read, if you read, you know, the liner notes and what they played and stuff. Um, but it doesn't look particularly heavy. This could, this could have been a prog album, right? No. Yeah. You, you you put that image on the front and it's it's screaming prog at you more than anything. and is that the reason why they changed the album cover you thought because the the, the second version which is the yeah. one that i bought totally screams metal and i saw yeah. that and i was like i gotta bring that home with me yeah 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 and this is so gorgeously recorded it's beautifully yeah. hugely recorded yeah really really good and it's an indie it's an indie yeah. album yeah pretty amazing so you mentioned twisted sister where did their where does their first album or two fit into all of this? Yeah, yeah, especially the first one because it's got some really heavy stuff on it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, they fit. Such a bizarre look, though, right? Yeah. Um, and they're and they're almost like they're they're almost like a Kiss band, right? So they're almost like you know the Kiss version of White Snake, uh, those, those early middle years of White Snake and stuff. So yeah, they're they're a weird one, and obviously they go more into you, you slot them into hair metal eventually right yeah. so yeah yep. all right martin get us caught up on uh news and happenings on your end your podcast and books and uh, contrarians well we got the video channel the contrarians and there's still the album cover shows going up and uh i i just did a review of the priest album and the bruce album and uh we had uh couple of shows on uh defending the 60s versus the 70s which is better defending the 70s versus 80s which is better uh, i got the audio podcast history and five songs with martin pop the last one was uh, called ancient sabbath reviews 
So I went and found a old a bunch of old Black Sabbath reviews and talked about what in the world could you compare Black Sabbath to in in the in the early seventies and stuff. So that was kind of cool. And I and the songs I picked were all <laughs> bands referenced in the reviews. So I picked Cream. MC5, Led Zeppelin, I don't know, Todd Rundgren, because someone said, oh, Todd, Todd should have produced the Sabbath album. And another reviewer said, oh, this band would be better if they added a keyboardist and that kind of stuff. So that was funny. Uh <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty fascinating episode, right? Because yeah, yeah, there was nobody really like Black Sabbath at the time. So, yeah. but we owed critics always like to compare things right so yeah I, I got all these i got all these resources out and i and i before i changed it to ancient sabbath reviews it was just going to be old reviews and i might i might do one uh my next one might be ancient zeppelin reviews because i've got a bunch of zeppelin reviews that are pretty funny too but i i've often as i said in the front of this episode i often thought that would make a really good rock book go back to those old reviews and see what you possibly could say about cowboys from hell when it came out you know, what were, yeah. what did they say about the first corn album when it came out? You know, right. I remember, I remember living through that at brave words, what it was like hearing corn. And, and we thought, wow, that's, that's pretty different. That's, yeah. This is kind of a new kind of music, you know? Um, so, so it's, it's cool seeing that. Um, and then there's the classic uh, uh, the sad wings of destiny got reviewed in Rolling Stone. And surprisingly it was a pretty accurate review. It was, it was pretty well done. Uh, and other ones just totally missed the mark. Rolling Stone. You could do a whole book just talking about Rolling Stone reviews, uh, which ones people completely laugh out loud at, which ones were actually kind of kind of good, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting idea. You know how how did people describe Hendrix in day one, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's hard to fathom because we're at a point now where what really has been coming around of late that's really new. I mean, you talk about the the corn situation, that's like what 25 years ago now already. Yeah. Have we had anything kind of new and exciting like that since? Yeah. You know, whether you like it or not, you you uh, you can't deny how different that was. So to try and go back and what it would be like to hear a Jimi Hendrix for the first time when yeah. he's happening had to, to talk about and try and decipher, you know, Black Sabbath and Paranoid as those albums are coming out or Led Zeppelin's first album or two. That's Montrose one who got it, who didn't. Right. Right. Like, and, and I, if I remember correctly from doing my Montrose book, I think basically no one got it. They, they would just say things like, ah, it's the same old warmed over hard rock crap, you know, and all this stuff. It's like, well, no, it's not right. You know, <laughs> So now all these years later, we, we hail it as this classic that it is. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, some of these people I mean, guys don't would say things like mountain don't. did it better and all this kind of stuff. Right. And it's like, Oh, it's just, you know, Sabbath, it was just a bunch of cream licks redone and stuff. It's like, no, you know, it's like, so it, it is, it is quite funny. I, I remember even, um, you know, Richie Rano never got over that negative review of the, of stars in Rolling Stone that just ticked him off for decades afterwards i i think it still does because they got a bad review right and they deserved a better review and it's it's kind of true right so uh yeah it's you you could do a whole entire book looking at this kind of stuff right yeah it's pretty fascinating actually when you think yeah. about it yeah. real quick your thoughts on the uh the slayer reunion yeah i <sighs> I think it's it's weird coming on the banks of the Kerry King news so fast. It's like, you know, PR wise, it's just like sweeps that away kind of thing. Right. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a live thing. I mean, I, I bet it will turn into an album. Right. Uh, it prob probably will. So. But, you know, the way Kerry was talking, it's like Tom doesn't want to do any of this anymore. It's like, whoa, well, okay. that, that's the weird thing. It's just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, We've heard nothing about Kerry's new album for the last couple of months, right? We've read nothing about him kind of bad mouthing the rest of the guys in the band, and how I, I haven't heard from them since the last show we played, and I don't think Tom is interested, and he's you know, uh, it's just been this whole anti Slayer thing. Slayer is done, sweep it under the rug, and then literally as soon as you know they release a song from the new Kerry album, it's like immediately now we've got slayer shows now all of a sudden tom is like i can't wait to get back and play and you know everybody's like yes we're you know this will be great and granted i know it's only two shows but did someone just say we've got a boat a shit ton of money to throw you would you guys play a couple shows and they're like yeah why not right yeah exactly. it's gotta be all about the money i can't i can't 
to me, I don't feel that this is something that they really, really, really want to do. They're doing it for the money, right? They could probably play these songs in their sleep, so it's not a big deal. But then it, again, it, it just to me, it yeah. just kind of undermines the whole Kerry King solo album, which I I felt they were going to really push, and there's been a lot of buzz about it, uh, as as much as it sounds like Slayer anyway. But still, uh, I, I just think this is a really odd and weird timed uh, thing to do at this at this moment. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, every time these guys just keep being abandoned later life, you go, well, what what are the options? I mean, if you still want to have an income or need an income, it's like any other option for you pays one tenth of of uh, of what you can do here. Not even one tenth. I mean, you you know, you haven't spent a whole life scraping together a career of academia and rising the corporate ladder to have this other career or be a high level academic or in business somewhere. You just you you spent your time elsewhere, right? So this is what you built up for to to be a lucrative thing in your fifties and sixties, right? Yeah. Like like everybody else's career path, this is what you did. So so it's like, are you gonna drive an Uber or something? Something. I mean, are you are you, you know, are you going to go work at Home Depot? I mean, th this is literally what you're this is what you're qualified for besides being a massive rock star. Right. So yeah. it, it just makes no sense. You may as well play shows. Right. Or make records. Well, yeah. And even if they don't want to make records anymore, um, could they play a handful of dates a year and make a good amount of cash where that's just what they do for the next decade? Yeah. You know, Tom saves up his voice because you know, Tom's voice is not what it used to be. They don't have to spend that much time together because basically everything we're hearing is they don't they don't like each other all that much anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I think w w a lot of the stuff I've been reading is that there's like two camps. There's the fans that never want Slayer to go away ever and were pissed off when they called it a day five years ago. And then there's the other camp who are tired of these bands constantly announcing we're done. This is the last show, last tour ever. We're never getting back together again. And then they always come back again. Like in other words, never letting go. Cause I've, I've seen both over the last couple of days. Uh, personally for me, I think you and I are in agreement here. It's like my days with Slayer being one of my favorite bands was a long time ago. I respect yeah. them. I still like a lot of the early albums, but do I need to go see Slayer again? no, um, but I know people who are going to rush to go see both of these shows. If they announce more, they'll see as many as possible. I get it. People yeah. love Slayer. This is a beloved yeah. band. But all this kind of like stop and start, stop and start thing, it's like just stick to one thing. And, I, you know, is is the fact that uh, Kerry's new solo record, did, did he feel that maybe uh, there's not enough buzz on this? Maybe it's not going to sell that well. Maybe the prospects of a tour is not all that lucrative. Let's just put Slayer back together. I'll I'll convince the other guys, and we'll do this and make make a boatload of cash. I don't know. I, I'm not I'm not privy to the uh, yeah. behind the scenes stuff here, but it just seems kind of weird. The timing of it is just very very bizarre. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, coming up here on the channel in just a couple hours, we've got uh, the professor's picks. Ken Golden's coming in to uh, show off a bunch of stuff that is being released today on this Friday. Got a very special show tonight for you. Uh, had a nice chat with uh, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw last night. And uh, nice. he's going to come and talk about this uh, brand new band that he, whom gods destroy, along with uh, Derek Sherinian and Dino Jalusic and others. Very, very cool album that's hitting in just, just a couple of weeks. So uh, stay tuned for that. Tomorrow we got the UK Connection with uh, Simon Bray and Stephen Reed and myself. And then we've got, and of course, that's about some, uh, all about shitty album covers. So we know everybody likes shitty album cover shows. Martin showed one of them tonight, that Metal Church album cover. <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't miss that one. I was like, oh boy. Classic, right? yeah. um, and then, I saw and you like, crack a smile on that one. Yeah. yeah. I was like, woof. <laughs> that was bad, yeah. yeah. Kurt Vanderhoof even knows how bad that is. Um, and then uh, ranking the albums on Sunday with uh, the uh, three albums from the great U.S. Horn jazz rock band chase i'm sure martin's going to tune into that one right yeah. <laughs> that's that horrific story right that's crazy well you know that the uh the um plane crash thing yes right? oh yes yes yeah. yes yeah. yeah it's terrible yeah this yeah. uh yeah. 
Yeah, nobody talks about that one really. Everybody always talks about the the Skinner plane crash, but yeah, Bill Chase uh, killed in that plane crash uh, all those years ago and derailed what was looking to be a pretty promising for a career for a band who are very Maybe much. I got it wrong. I thought it was more than just one guy. I thought it was two or three guys. Or I something. think a couple. Yeah, a couple of them got yeah, killed. Yeah, so, he yeah. was he was the the band leader. But yeah, yeah. um. Yeah, if you like Chicago, early Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears, I mean, Chase were a really, really great band. They had the three albums and then on a major label and that was it. So I'll be ranking those three albums. And uh, yeah, we will not have a show next week uh, as I will be away all week on a business trip. But Martin and I are coming back two weeks from today to do our yearly visit with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominations. So uh, we will go through all of the nominated artists. And as always, Martin and I will pick what are we, three we're going to pick, right? We're each going to pick our three who we would induct if it was up to us. So I know a lot of people look forward to that every year. A lot of people hate the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but we're going to we're going to talk about it anyway. Just just to, just to at least talk about who's being nominated and maybe our questions as to why some of them are and whatnot. But uh, so yeah, that'll be two weeks from today. So stay tuned for that and visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube all together all the damn time. Please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell. So you get alerted of all of our content as it posts. And please do hit the like button before you leave for Martin Popoff. I'm P. Pardo. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. We'll see you here in two weeks back at the fun house till then. Take care. Bye-bye.